Welcome to the Find My Catalyst podcast. We all have problems we're looking to solve, and we know that there are solutions out there, but we struggle with this. How do we find the solution? Where does that nudge come from to help us take the next step and start solving tough problems? This podcast is designed to help you find your catalyst and take that next step. I'm Mike Simmons. I'm the founder of Catalyst Sale. This episode is brought to you by the Catalyst Sale Game Plan. It's our approach to goal setting and execution. If you head to catalystsell.com forward slash game, you can find more information. My catalyst today is Adam Vasquez. Adam is the co-founder and partner at Herd Media. He's also the host of the Content is for Closers podcast. Adam, it is good to see you again. How are you doing? Mike, thanks for having me. And I have to commend you when, before we started. You said my last name and it was right the first time. And I don't know of anybody else who's done that. So uh, kudos. It's good. It's good. Good to great. With the number of times that I've butchered last names before and even first <laughs> names or even forgotten first names, it's good to get a win at some point. People love adding L's into my last name, K's, W's. I feel like like numbers at times, it gets weird. So uh, you, you did a great job. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> well, so we came uh, across each other. I was on your podcast and yeah. we had we connected up through that and then said, well, let's bring you on here because you're doing some really interesting things relative to growing your growing your business. So let's talk a little bit about what you're working on today. What where are you, where's your attention focused? Yeah. So just quick background. I was in the ad agency industry for almost 10 years. Was, I worked for a couple of different consultancies. One was called Wipro, which is a global company, 100,000 employees. I was in their growth division. And then from there, jumped to VaynerMedia. A lot of people are probably familiar with Gary Vee. That's his shop. And went into that job telling my team there, my leaders... Hey, I want to be here. I want to learn from you all, but just, you know, I really want to start my own business. I don't even know what the business is. And so I'm going to do whatever I can to help this business move forward. So I have a story to tell of as to why I can go start my own business. And, you know, they were very, said all the right things when I said that and, and were embracing of that. But I was pretty surprised, to be honest with you, that they actually backed all of that up. So a couple of years later, I decided, all right, it's time, you know, it's now or never type of thing. I want to go out and do my own. A thing and I got all the support in the world from from Gary and Mickey Cloud and the whole team over there. So very thankful for to them for that. Uh, that was about five years ago, this past May, and we started the company that I have now, which is called Herd Media, and we help technology companies, VCs, uh, startups tell their stories primarily through podcast and video, and that's kind of where we planted our flag and what we're doing. Why did you go down the podcast route? What is it about podcasting from a storytelling perspective that really got you excited? You know, I know your your theme around finding your catalyst and just starting and taking that first step. And to be honest, I actually just weirdly posted about LinkedIn on about this morning while we're recording this. I did it out of pragmatic just effort to get some awareness to our company. So at the time, we were, you know, like like a lot of companies starting off, we were a services company pretty much willing to do whatever needed to be done digitally for whoever would pay us, right? And I used the experience at VaynerMedia. I knew a lot of the strategies and methods that worked, especially at the brand level. And our idea was, let's take that and apply it to the mid-market. Lots of people have done this, nothing new. But we needed to get awareness out. Like People didn't know me as me. They knew me as VaynerMedia guy, or they knew me as you know strategist at such and such agency. And so we need to get the word out about what we were doing. And we just started a podcast for ourselves to try to get make connections with other people in the industry that we could potentially partner with, serve in some way like as a customer relationship or hire or like we didn't really know. Honestly, it was just kind of throwing some stuff at the wall. And recorded a first episode, it was it was really bad. Like sometimes I have bad episodes now, but that one was was so bad. And uh but just kept recording and and making more and thankfully got some attention from both regional and national media outlets because of some of the guests that we were able to bring on. Again, this is where Gary Vee, so kind, came on our show, spent time with me, talking with me, and I was able to tell other guests, hey, Gary Vee's been on the show. You should come on the show. You know, So news people were covering it from the standpoint of like, who's this guy that's able to get these high, high uh, levels? And again, this is five years ago. Not everyone had a podcast like today. And so it was a little bit unique. And in that process, we were able to see number one, interesting podcasting is like a pretty, it works, you know, like there's, it's a pretty efficient 
way to connect with people that you want to connect with in whatever arena. And secondly, we have some skill around this. Like we've just done it so many times. We did like 300 episodes in, in, in our first run and saw we have some ability here. And so other people then started reaching out to us and saying, hey, we saw you were featured. Hey, we saw you had this episode. Could you help us? And that started as consulting and then you know, kind of like an outsourced service line. And now we have a productized version of it. And it's kind of just grown over the years. So let's talk about the transition to a productized version of a service. What did that look like? How did you, how would have been some of the lessons you've learned as you've gone through that part of the journey? Yeah. Again, I feel like efficiency or pragmatism is probably at the heart of a lot of the decisions we make, but it started from, we're a little bit unique in our company in the fact that all of our people are full-time. So if you work with us, you, you know th- that's that's your main job, and the reason that's important is because for two reasons. Number one, most people are just like outsourcing to other people, and so their cost is variable when it comes yep. to producing shows, episodes, whatever. Our cost is not; it's this, it's stable, it's the same always. And so we have this, you know, library of hours, and every time we add a new team member, that you know exponentially gets bigger. And we just knew from our operations folks that we weren't using all of those hours. And you know, at the end of the day, that's sort of what we're selling. So that was the initial spark was like, how do we be more efficient with the product that we're selling, which is this time? And we do sell, and most of the shows that we produce are, you know, higher end, completely white glove, tailor-made productions. But there's a lot of people out there who already have a show or uh, can have been producing it themselves and editing it themselves for a long time, but don't want to. And so that was where the idea came from in terms of just creating a productized service, I guess I should have described it, in which you know we don't come up with the brand, we don't come up with all of those things. We just, for a monthly fee, you can upload and have our team edit your show you know, as much as you can produce over the, the course of the month. And uh, I can't remember exactly your question, but that was that was sort of the birth of where that idea came from. Well, I think it's really powerful as you start to look at different ways to meet a market need that's happening and things that start to shift. Because yeah, I, you know, everybody has a podcast. It seems like uh, now many, which of is them, great. Uh, that's, that's how it should be. And it, so, why do you say it's great? Why why is that how it should be? Well, because if you look at again, just and I'm not science guy, so I don't know why I keep talking about like efficiency. But if you just look at the most efficient way to number one, meet people, and number two, create something that is stored on the internet and serves you as a company over time, there's really just nothing else that meets podcasting's level. And I think that for two reasons: number one, podcasting is so intimate, as you know. Like you and I have had one conversation prior to this, and I feel like I really know you. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know everything about you, but I know where you live. I know you like golf. I know, like, I know things about you because of our one conversation that you just couldn't have on a normal sales call or even on like a text-based interview. So that's the first thing. You really get to have relationships with the people that you interact with. The second thing is this documentation, this conversation, like we're doing it now in 2022, but someone in 2025 could very easily find value out of what we're talking about now. The tactics might change or whatever, but something might stick and resonate. And in that case, you and I are benefiting from their listen three years from now. And again, that can happen in blogs, that can happen, in other, but the combination of those two, the intimacy and the evergreen nature of them, to me, is super unique. Pretty powerful too, when you can get different voices out there with different perspectives. So now you can find the voice or perspective that resonates with you, mm. which helps to accelerate your ability to apply a lot of the things that we're talking about. So the layer, the bar to enter is relatively low. What are some of the common mistakes though that people make when saying, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and start a podcast. I want to go ahead and put a podcast out there. Yeah. I think probably the same mistakes, especially if you're like a technical founder or someone that you've heard others make when they say, I'm going to go start a business, right? Like overthinking unimportant things like the name or what color scheme you're going to use or what technology platform it needs to be hosted on. Like all of these details that ultimately are are sort of just plug and play and can be swapped out. The core thing is how are you going to help someone through whatever it is that you're creating? The business, the, the YouTube series, the podcast, et cetera. So that's, I'd say, the first mistake. The second one right next to it is making it about you, making it about us as hosts, right? 
And it's a very easy trap to fall into, especially if you get just the littlest bit of success because it starts to feel like, oh, people like to hear what I have to think, you know, and uh, in reality, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but what serves them is not making the show about you or your product or your service or your company or whatever. It's about making it about what their problem is and what their what their needs are. And so I would say those two are pretty... I mean, you spent a lot of time in the space. Do you agree? You have something else yeah. you would add to? I think that's it. I think you got to be really careful, just like in sales and you're building out teams, you got to be really careful, careful about the assumptions you make. And it's really easy for you to fall into the trap of telling people what you're doing and hoping that somebody nods and validates it versus asking questions and getting to the root of what people are struggling with. So like as you think about the productized service that you've launched, and this kind of date the podcast a little bit, we're, we're talking here in June. This will probably go live sometime in late July, early August time period. You'll have 60 days or so of the productized service under your belt and delivered there are going to be a number of things that will come up in each of those customer interactions where you start to modify and iterate on that service that you just wouldn't know if you didn't get it out there first. So sure, push the button, get it out there. That's a Brian Fanzo thing. Push the button, get it out there. Then listen for feedback, ask questions, and be intentional about how you, how you gather that be careful about your assumptions because assumptions will, will kill your business, whether or kill your business or kill your, your podcast. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Totally agree. So let's talk a bit about some of the reasons why people are reluctant to go out and create something like this. So it's, Hey, I don't know that I have an interesting opinion, or I don't know that I really feel comfortable with my hearing my own voice, or I don't know that whatever, like they're are these, I don't know things that will go on in everybody's head. How can, what are some questions that people can ask themselves to help them break through that? Given the experience you have across so many different people who are creating podcasts and content Mm -hmm. that you've created, how do we break through that? Yeah. I think that part of it will be not focusing so much on the things that you don't have and thinking about what it is that you know, or, or you can teach. For instance, you know, we talked a minute ago about the technical founder who is listening or wants to grow their company or grow their business or find the next move. If you're a technical founder, you inherently have something that you're very good at or know a lot about because I'm not a tech, I, I can't do any of that stuff. So you have all, a whole skill set and a whole knowledge base that most people don't have. And I think, you know, the, one exercise to go through is what can I teach or what can I say or what can I create that will in theory, you don't have to actually do it, but that will, in theory, bring me revenue in the next whatever week, in the next 30 days, in the next whatever it is you want to say. So if I have to create something that's going to bring me a dollar in the next seven days, that's going to get me super focused on what I actually have to offer in terms of value. Because you're not going to fluff around with all the extra stuff. You're not going to even let yourself get caught up in the, I can't, or should I, or all of those negative questions, you're going to get really laser focused on what you know and what value you actually have to bring to the market. So I think that could be a really um, simple thing for someone to go through. The other thing is if you are a technical founder, you're trying to scale past yourself and you're trying to think through like, you know, my skill set is not marketing or we're constrained because I'm a stop gap for a lot of the things that we do. That's where creating and creating content and specifically documenting. So that's where I think podcasting again has a leg up or YouTube or any of those things allows you to inherently scale past yourself, right? Media lives more, lives on past, like you and I were just talking about a specific moment in time. So you might not as a technical founder, be a great salesperson or have the desire to go to a room and talk to a hundred people one-on-one, one-on-one, but, but you can record your thoughts. You can create something that plays that sales role for you. So it doesn't have to mean that you hire a hundred salespeople. It could be that you yourself act as that person through content. Um, So those are just two little things that might help someone as they're they're going through the initial stages of it. And it's pretty powerful when you can go back in and review the tape, because when you review the tape, then you go through. And like one of the, one of the things I wish I would have done differently when first launched the podcast is not lean so heavily on editing. And Mm. we, we, and it, it wasn't that we leaned really heavily on editing, but 
one of the challenges that comes up is periodically I'll say, um, well, those usually are pulled out or I breathe a little bit heavy into the microphone. Those things get pulled out. Had I gotten more deliberate into that part rather than listening to the, uh, the produced version, listen to the non-edited version, I think I would have learned quickly how to adjust things to avoid some of those nuances and some of those tendencies. And the way that I've seen it happen directly is when I put video out, I don't edit the video. I just put the, vi- I just put the video out. So my video has gotten much tighter. Still, when we're doing the podcast thing, I will still kind of lean on the, the thinking, but these are open conversations. Like We don't way back when. So as we're going, talking through lessons learned and all the other kind of crap, what we did way, way, way back in the day was, and I say we, because this was back when co-founder and I, Mike, were doing the podcast together. We would script out questions. We would say, mm-hmm. ask these questions. And things were just too scripted. They weren't natural. And then we got to the point where we said, okay, well, we're not going to script out questions anymore. And we're going to make it much more conversational and things got better. And now we've evolved even further where now the majority of the episodes that we that I do are have guests on them. It's rare that I do a one-on-one episode. I'll do them periodically. But if you want the one-on-one stuff, one of the best ways to get to that is the are some of the video or not the one-on-one, the, the individual perspective, Solo, it's, sure. it's the, video, the video stuff. So I, I, I hope if there's something people take away from this part of the conversations, it's, it's an iterative process. In order to iterate, you actually have to start doing first. Once you start doing, then you can reflect, assess, evaluate, and then start to adapt. So really, really cool, really cool stuff. Yeah. I, uh, first of all, I feel sorry for your editor if they're going to have to take out all of my ums because I, that's just littered. But there it is right there. The, uh, the game film thing is a really great analogy. Well, you know, played sports, played basketball, and you hated, especially if you knew you got away with something like in the game, you know, you threw a bad pass, you whatever, missed a defensive assignment, but you knew in the back of your head that's coming out at practice. Saturday mornings were rough. Saturday mornings. <laughs> yeah. You knew it was coming back around. And uh, I think that's that's the hard work of creating. Sometimes I hear a lot of people say, "Oh, I never listen to my episodes. I never listen to my." That's foolish to me. I mean, you know, each their own. But that those are free practice reps. You've already made the thing, and I get it. Nobody likes to hear their voice. Nobody likes to, you know. But you might as well use it as an opportunity to get better. So totally with you on that. So let's talk about how people get started. So you know, you go through. And one of the cool things about a service like the one that you provide is they can start with training wheels and some guidance and some assistance. This is not their day job. So sure. how, how does somebody get started? Like I've got an idea. I want to get out there and start putting some content out there. And I know we talked a little bit about some of the common mistakes. Let's start talking about actionable steps that we can start doing. What are the first couple of things that you would do if I'm thinking about creating and I've got a day job or I'm doing a lot of other stuff. What are some things I should be thinking about? Yeah. So it's just, again, just like anything else that you'd, you'd create. So, uh, you know, again, focus on the macro things, yep. not on the uh, whatever, the convenient details that can help you procrastinate. And so what those might look like specifically when it comes to content creating or podcast creating is validating that what you're going to say or what you're going to make is actually helpful. So one way we we encourage people to do this is if you already have a business and you're making this for your business, an easy place to start is your FAQ section. You know, what is it that people are consistently coming up and causing friction between you and your service or between you and your customers? All of those are valid ideas that you can create in order to to help your customer. A second thing might be going through and and talking to especially if it's if it's not a business, it's something that you're just interested in or something that you want to do on the side, having in real life conversations with as many people as possible. And this sounds simple, but like, I'm talking about like hundred people, you know, if you, if you can, I'll give you, when we launched the productized service last Friday, there was a list of, we had it right around a hundred people that I either personally, manually, I mean, you were on it, Mike, that I either manually DM'd or send an email to and said, Hey, we're doing this launch. If you know anyone who's interested in this, we'd love to, to get their eyes on it and get some feedback from it. That's super, super valuable. It's also super, super time consuming. I mean, that, that takes a lot of time to sit there and because you send the initial 100 messages and especially something like that, 
80, 90% of people are going to respond either to just encourage you, thumbs up, or with questions, whatever. And so then you have to go through that whole engagement. That's not fun. That's not automated. That's not passive income. Like it's none of those things that are constantly talked about, but it's critical in that creative process because if no one responded or if no one responded with more questions for follow up or interest on how to get started, that's a signal that probably we shouldn't spend too much more time on that past what we've already invested. It goes to the same thing with content. If you can't have conversations with people who are like-minded and looking for answers in a specific area, it might not be a good area for you to, to spend your time creating in. But then past that, I would say just, when we've already said it, but just start recording. Like, you know, Zoom is free. AirPods, you probably have, where you have the wired headphones. Like the technology and the, I mean, if I showed you the setup that we use when we first started our show, it was really, really bad. It was a camera with an onboard mic. And that was it in terms of the audio. It was, uh, we did them in person at the time and we'd both be standing. I don't even know why. Why didn't we have chairs? We had chairs in the office and we didn't use them. Like just all these bad decisions, but we're still here five years later. So something worked enough that it's panned out. So I would just encourage like, don't let any of those details stop you. Don't even let your own lack of charisma or whatever that you think in your head you have stop you. Instead, just try it. You're going to get better. The next episode, you'll be better than you were today in a hundred episodes. If you stick with it for a hundred episodes, I guarantee you, you'll have something positive come out of it. Absolutely. You'll improve your listening skills. You'll improve your communication skills. You'll even just have data to understand what's working and what's not working. So someone goes through and they, they decide, all right, I'm going to push the button. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to communicate out to people. And I really like how you highlighted the importance of getting out to a hundred people, whatever the number is, your number sure. might be 25. Your number might be a thousand hundred is a good number. You're going to get some really good signal out of that and listen, not for what you want to hear, but for what people are actually telling you, because those things will come out and help you avoid some of the biases that you have around, hey, I'm so certain that I've got this idea. And we've run into it. You see it in when people start businesses. It's, I've got a hammer. I'm going to run around. I'm going to find a bunch of nails. Right. What Adam is talking through is saying, hey, you know what? I believe that there are a lot of nails out there. Let me go out and figure out what type of nails they are out there and whether or not the nail problem is super interesting. And then I can come in and start delivering the solution and start to see where things impact. So the process that Adam just went through impacts how we launch products. It impacts how we launch podcasts. It impacts how we, how we write. So really, yeah. really, really cool stuff. But what about reaching out to others? So engaging others and, and you know, thinking about as I'm getting started, how do I get more people involved in this journey? What guidance would you give others as they start to think about, oh, look, I don't want to bother people. I know that it'd be exciting to have that person on there. They don't know who I am. Like, What does that outreach look like? And how do you help people overcome some of the negative stuff that might be going inside their head relative to that type of outreach? Yeah, I'd say two things here. So there's like the, the quantitative, the numbers game, and then the qualitative. And on the, on the quantitative side, again, it's kind of what we just talked about. People look too quickly to automate growth. And we see this all the time when we're launching a new YouTube show or a podcast. People are asking like, okay, when should we start doing paid media? When should we start you know, doing episode swaps with bigger shows? What blah, blah, blah. Like, What's the growth hack? The growth hack is you need to go reach out to the first 10, 50, 100, 200 people that you think either would be great guests on your show to help your audience, your future audience, or would be interested in the content that you're creating as an audience member. And you need to manually introduce yourself to them and introduce your show to them probably not introduce yourself to them. Let me take that back. Introduce your show to them. These should be people that you know, because you've already validated the idea. So you know, they exist, that you know, are interested in this concept. And so you're able to go directly to them and say, here's the thing. Remember I said I was going to do it. I did it. You know, do you want to be a guest or would you listen? Would you let me know what your feedback is? And until you're past, call it a thousand listeners per episode, I, you know, I wouldn't do anything that's not manual. 
I wouldn't do any automated things. If you're getting a thousand downloads per episode, okay, then then you can start to think about whatever it might be, buying an ad or doing some episode swaps with other creators who have similar audiences. Those are easy things to do. If if I mean, we're doing it right now. I have an audience, you have an audience. We did, we're both co uh, yep. interviewing each other and it makes sense. But if one of us, if I only had, you know, a couple of dozen listens each episode, well, that doesn't make as much sense than for you. You know what I mean? So you need to make sure that you actually have something to offer in that sense. That's the quantitative side. Do the effort. I think that's clear. Uh, the, on the qualitative side, I would say, you know, finding a way to get right mentally with the fact that you are providing value to the guest and to the audience. And I say this as someone who is a people pleaser. I hate bothering people. My very first job out of college was making cold calls on the phone. We're supposed to call a hundred people a day. And it was a nightmare for me because it was just constantly interrupting people's day in order to try to sell them recruiting services. And my sales manager told me, the one thing that I learned from that job, my sales to management told me, listen, you are interrupting them. You're trying to make their business better. You know, you're offering this thing. Now, I did not believe it and it showed in my sales numbers, but the idea is right. The, the idea is correct. You are creating something that is going to both help your audience, even as you're developing it. And secondly, expose, and let's just assume it's an interview-based show, expose whoever you're interviewing to that audience. And I get it. Both of them are kind of like, it's like chicken and egg. Well, I don't have either one. But long-term, remembering the evergreen nature of all of this stuff that we're talking about, it's going to benefit them that they are doing this with you and it's going to benefit your audience that they're listening with you. And as you think, really kind of reframe it that way mentally, it'll give you a lot of confidence in asking, approaching people who you may think would say no. The other thing is, I mean, Mike, you know this, but like microphones are magic to getting yeses. And so there's a lot, like no one should have come on my show today still. Like no one should really be coming on my show just purely based on you know what I've done or who I am or any of those types of things, but they do. Like our success rate is above ninety five percent in terms of asking and getting guests to come on our show. And the reason that is is because we've done enough legwork to show like okay, this seems legitimate enough, and the microphone is compelling. People want to tell their story. They want to be able to get their themselves out there. So it's less scary than you think. But those are some of the things I do to, to reframe it mentally. Yeah. Well, and and you've got a great title for the show. We've not talked about it. I'll, oh, yeah. We'll have said something in the intro, but so the name of the show is? Content is for closers. Yeah. So who's not going to want to kind of move into that where they say, <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And there's so many, you know, there's so many people who will beat up the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Alec Baldwin, coffee is for closers closers and yeah, Coco is for so cobblers good. and all of that other kind of stuff. <laughs> and we all have, we all have fun with it. Here's a way to genuinely interact with people, you know, that allows them to share their story, impact others and can lead to that next logical step, which in some cases is the, you know, what's the meeting or it's the getting the contract or actually implementing, helping people solve problems. I think it's awesome that you were fortunate enough to have a manager who said, look, you're out here helping people and their business and was able to highlight that for you. You know, the challenge that you ran into, it sounded like, and some others will run into is so is whether or not they really believe it. Do they believe that they're helping? Do they believe that they're they're interrupting? But that's a huge breakthrough mm. to be able to to move in. And you know, a way to shift perspective there is imagine if you had a solution. Like imagine if I'm walking down the street and I see you pushing a bike that has no error in the tire. And I happen to have a bike pump in my pocket for whatever reason. And I just walk past you rather than saying, Hey, can I help? Looks like you've got a challenge. Like we, in one instance, I'm being a jerk. I'm just walking past you. I'm being selfish. In the other instance, I'm really trying to help. So be careful about who, be aware of who you're helping, which gets to a lot of the stuff that Adam was talking about before, like be deliberate, be genuine in the way that you engage. Very good. Yeah. If you did that, I would be interested to see, those are some enormous pockets. So I'd love to yeah. see the pants that hold the bike pump. You should make those. It was a huge reach. Be, I, I would have no, to go no, back no. and bring out cargo shorts. Like everybody, 
walking around in cargo <laughs> shorts again. Just cargo. Yeah. Just hang, I love that. Just hang, hanging on. I'll be, I'll be like MacGyver, you know, while well, MacGyver would figure out a way to just you know, blow up the tire with. It with sounds a like a find your catalyst branded apparel uh, opportunity <laughs> is where, is where I'm headed with it. So I want some, I want some credit on that. Now all you're going to do is inspire a new logo. Inspire <laughs> yeah, a new exactly. logo. It'll be a bike pumps are us. So <laughs> when people go through the, this whole thing around evergreen content, how do you think about repurposing content? Yeah, I think that that's obviously a pretty hot topic and something that, again, Gary V helped push into the mainstream. So it was, was very thankful to learn from him. I think one thing people miss when it comes to repurposing content is the repurpose part. So you hear a lot about like, here is how I turn one podcast episode into a blog post, an article, a newsletter, a YouTube video, you know, an Instagram post. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's great for volume, but are you actually doing the part where, you know, when you design a piece of content for a platform, there's a certain intent that goes into it. There's a certain purpose behind it. So to repurpose it then inherently, you need to change the content itself in order for it to be more successful on a given platform. And I think that's a mistake that people make. They say, I make it once and then you know, I hit magic resize in Canva and now it's ready to go on every platform. <laughs> and uh, in reality, the way that people consume on various platforms is different. Like mentally, they are in different headspaces when they're on Twitter versus TikTok versus LinkedIn versus YouTube. And so you need to come at it with a fresh perspective and think, yes, this is the baseline message. And, th- and I think that was the purpose of what Gary was saying. I say something one time, the message is true enough that it can resonate on multiple channels. But it's still up to you as the creator to take that message and to tailor it in such a way that it meets the audience member wherever they happen to be on a given platform. Design with intention and be intentional in the way that you're working through this. So talking about repurposing content and then you know, thinking about just different mediums that are out there, one of the things that comes to mind for me is kind of this decision between audio and video and how to think about audio versus video. How do you think about audio versus video? And, and what are some important things for folks to consider when thinking about audio and video? Yeah, I think it goes to what we're just talking about, the intent and the, the purpose of what you're creating an asset for. So when you're creating an, an, an audio asset, it's for usually long form consumption there's going to be an intimacy there. There's going to be a relationship built with the host or the speaker, the narrator, whatever. When you're thinking about video, a lot of times the most successful video is much shorter, bite-sized snacks. Whenever I say this, people are like, well, Rogan. Yeah, you're not Rogan. Whoever you are, you're just not Rogan. So like, don't worry about him. He's an anomaly. That's like saying Michael Jordan can do stuff with his eyes closed, Like, but we're not Michael Jordan. So yeah, I would say Again, just thinking of it differently. So if you're going to do something that is meant to be created for audio, uh, video, especially as people who are amateur creators, and I'm including myself, like we're not celebrities, we're not actors, whatever. What I would recommend is make sure you have a tight script, make sure that you have something that's going to be able to be said in a very concise fashion and something that eventually hopefully can be clipped into a very, you know, I hate the word, but it's just true, a very snackable piece of content, something that someone can walk away with the idea in five or 10 seconds. Whereas with audio, it's okay if you've got the ums in audio, right? People are used to hearing a conversation. They're used to participating in conversations where there's verbal clutter and there's, it takes more than a sentence to get an idea out in a lot of ways, people are looking for that. Like if you think about the use case of, of podcasting, it's you know before uh, COVID, it was my drive home, I'm bored, I'm tired of listening to sports radio, I want to listen to something that like makes me feel like I'm doing something, right? Well, you're not doing anything, you're just bored. And so you want to hear, and I love it. I'm, I'm glad people are like that, but that's the way it is. And same thing with uh, today. I listen to podcasts primarily when I'm working out and I don't want to think about the pain <laughs> that I'm in or I am walking my dog and I don't want to just walk in, in silence. And so again, I'm just trying to find something to stimulate my mind. Well, I'm not looking for like 15 second nuggets that I can apply right now. I'm looking for a conversation that I can glean some things from. So it just goes back to that purpose to, to answer the question between audio and video. It's really powerful to hear you talk about being intentional in the work that you're doing. And that's the thing that's resonated throughout the conversation is operate with a level of intention 
think about where the audience is when they're going to be consuming the information. What are they going to be doing at the time? And then the next thing is kind of what they can do next. So on the Mm. what they could do next, let's say someone's out there and they're thinking about a podcast and trying to figure out if it's right for their organization or right for whatever it is that they're building. How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, lots of different ways. I write about this almost every day on Twitter at Adam Vasquez, V-A-Z-Q-U-E-Z. Our website for our company is trustherd.com. You can read about the different things that we do there. And then we produce a podcast, like you mentioned, where we just talk about how creators are creating content that closes business one way or another for them. Content is for closers, content is for closers.com. So tons of options for anyone who's uh, looking for more conversation around this. Awesome. Well, Adam, thanks for the great conversation. We'll include links in the show notes. If you know of somebody who would benefit from this conversation, please share it with them. Let Adam and I know via Twitter or LinkedIn, wherever you're sharing, just tag us. We'd like to see that happen. Sales is a thinking process. Business is a thinking process. Life is a thinking process. How are you thinking differently about your process? Mm-hmm.